challenges and big questions that the Shaky project address that are still unsolved today, 50 years later? Well, as the Shaky project was winding down, we wanted to do a follow-on robot we call the general factotum. You may remember that. And the idea, now what I do. The idea was that it would be a general purpose robot that would hang out with you and do all sorts of interesting tasks, just to help you out. So we could not get it funded. It still hasn't been done. But I continue to think it's a great idea because of a startling demographic fact that you might not be aware of. Within the next few years, we're going to pass a crossover point where for the first time in human history, there will be more people on the planet over the age of 65 than under the age of five. This trend is unprecedented in human history. It's irreversible, and it's going to have profound consequences. One consequence is that there's not going to be enough younger people around who are available to take care of all those older people. So I think a great research goal would be to make a robot that could help older people in their daily lives, help them get out of bed in the morning, help them get dressed, and so forth. This is not an easy challenge. Maybe it ranks as the grandest of the grand challenges. But the day will come when everybody's going to want this. So I think it's time to get started. Well, at first, the whole problem of human-level artificial intelligence making robots or other AI systems as smart as we are hasn't been solved, might not be solved for several more generations. Who knows? We've learned that we're very complicated up here and trying to duplicate what we do, well, we have to be a little humble about the magnitude of that task. But I do have a bit of a disappointment about research directions, and the disappointment is that not too many fo people followed our lead of trying to integrate lots of different AI, parts of AI, into a single system. That was the whole point of Shaky, as Peter mentioned, one of the big points. And I don't think there's a lot of that going on. There's some. Um, there is some integration. For example, the Google cars integrate a lot of different things, right? They do perception. They do planning. They seem to know where they're going and why they're going there. They have the California vehicle code built in. So they have a lot of knowledge. So there are exceptions. But I think that there could be more work. And I'd like to put in a plug for a colleague uh, Keith Clark at Imperial College, who's working on an extension of these Telio reactor programs, but especially his Q-log part of that system, which does reasoning. So there is reasoning going on. That would be adding reasoning to a robot language. And what I would like to see, there's a lot of work, of course, a lot of us are absorbed, not me, not anymore. This stuff gives me a headache, but uh, deep learning and to do the mathematics of deep learning is tough. But anyway, lots of good progress in deep learning, and most of it has been applied to perception. Most of it's been applied to perception. As a matter of fact, these deep learning networks, so-called, are supposedly something like models of the cortex. Now, the cortex does more than perceive. The cortex does action. The cortex makes plans. I would like to see one of these deep learning networks, in addition to doing pattern recognition, valuable and important as that is, hooked up to a robot and learn how to do robot actions. And I don't know how to start on that, but that's exactly the time people should get started. You know, the easy fruit is there. All you have to do is try some things, maybe all you have to do, try some things, see what happens. If that doesn't work, try something else. Um, where is the spirit? of adventure, as Peter mentioned in his talk, and doing things which other people think, well, I don't know, 
Will it get me a dissertation? Well, maybe not, but there's more important things in life. Um, so I, I, I agree you know, exactly with, the, with, with Peter and, and Nils, and, 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 but I want to talk about a different thing. Um, Shaky used perception to augment the world models. There were some parts of the world model built in, and trying to get use perception to get to some level that the systems could then think about in, for some version of think, for some value of think, and decide what to do in the world. And I think we're still not there. The deep learning has done great things in perception, but I think it leads people astray. Deep learning has surprised all of us. We're able to label images, but if a person does a task in the same way that deep learning, if a person does a task that deep learning performs well at, a person has a much wider competence that can be generalized about that particular task. Whereas the deep learning algorithms don't have that generalized competence and don't have the full semantics that we as people have when we see a scene. So I think the challenge is to get that level of semantics, and I was so pleased to hear Nils say it may be a few centuries away, because when I've said that to physicists who believe that AI is about to destroy the world, they say, no, 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 everyone else says it's five or ten years. How can you possibly say it's centuries? So thank you, Nils. Thank you. Let's listen to Manuela. just on a few. Definitely the concept that uh, robots have limitations and they can be on a symbiotic uh, autonomy uh, with uh, the other robots, with people and the web, accessing the information and knowledge on the web, asking humans for help, uh, be able to coordinate tasks, share knowledge with other robots, and eventually learn from these symbiotic autonomy uh, is a very in interesting uh, challenge for us. Uh, another challenge is really the ability to uh, be uh, robust in uh, their uh, execution, in their thinking, in their processing of the sensors, be robust and transferring knowledge from one place to another and being safe and being able to monitor its own uh, execution and detect if by uh, the environment, if the situation is abnormal with respect to their expectations, so safety and robustness. And the third challenge is the interaction with humans. Uh, how do robots and humans coexist in a way that uh, they can uh, refer uh, to situations, they can refer to tasks, they, they can bridge the gap between their representation, their knowledge, such that the interaction is much more seamless. Uh, so uh, there you go, symbiotic uh, interaction, symbiotic autonomy, interaction with humans, and safety and robustness, those are challenges that I think we are all excited to continue to address in these uh, AI and robotics. Thank you. Bye. Um, I was asked this question many times, so I will repeat myself. In my view, the fundamental question is how you go from measurements to symbols. Call them predicates, call them words, I don't care. It's a discrete entity. You know, I was a student of John McCarthy, and John McCarthy really believed that what you carry in your head are propositions and predicates. And so that's how he, he came from the tradition of um, church from Princeton and uh, going back to Burton and Russell, um, you know, truly trying to understand the, the, the discrete predicate calculus. And so he invented LISP. And so when you ask why the strip planner hasn't been mentioned as a number one accomplishment or, or lasting accomplishment, it, to my mind, the reason is that it was anchored in this symbolic predicate calculus. 
And as it turns out, um, it's very fragile because you have these predicates that are coming from measurements with some magic threshold. And they are not very robust. They, are, they change depending on the, the environment. And in my experience, vision and any non-contact sensing is most vulnerable to these transformations from signal to symbol. When you deal with physical measurements, velocity, acceleration, contact, you have very, very natural zero crossings that you can say yeah or no. But with the non-contact sensing, it's extremely vulnerable. I give you just one very simple example. Take uh, names of colors. What is white, what is black, depends on all your illumination, all your albedo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to my mind, this is really a profound question that we haven't solved. Philosophers talk about that, but it's a, it's a challenge to the next generation. Thank you. I'm going to agree with Regina and then elaborate on that because Shaky start, I agree, I agree completely. Um, <clears throat> that Shaky started out with a symbolic description or used as we saw in the slides, a, uh, a symbolic description of spaces, objects, actions, properties of parts of these things. Um, and it, it built goals, it had goals and it built plans which it could carry out. It was a single agent without any other agents in the world. There was a bit in the movie where an, a gremlin sneaks through and changes the world, but Shaky had no concept of that as another agent. Um, I believe that the discrete symbolic level of representation and organization is a really important part of cognition. Um, but the world the world we live in, is this working? Yes. yes, okay, the world we live in is continuous for all practical purposes in an, an awful lot of ways. And so the problem that's come to be called symbol grounding uh, needs to be solved. And furthermore, the solutions to that need to be learned and, and learned through experience. Um, now some of that learning well, the particular solutions, I think some of the important ones are outlined by the domains that, that were done by hand in Shaky. Space, objects, actions, properties, affordances, and so forth. But these need to be learned. Some of those have, have undoubtedly been learned over evolutionary time so that the individuals inherit the results of that evolutionary learning. But there is still a learning process. And one of the things that Rugina re referred to is that if the, the way symbols are grounded in the, dis in the continuous world involves essentially arbitrary thresholds, then that becomes very, very fragile. And we see in humans that our grounding doesn't seem to be terribly fragile. And I believe part of that comes from being able to construct new models um, at, as needed for the, the current properties, um, for the current demands of the current situation um, as, as, as it's needed. I uh, have thought about this problem from the question of what remains to be unsolved. And for me, popping up a higher level, I think a truly general purpose intelligent robot is obviously still unsolved. Um, I think if you ask a lot of undergraduate computer scientists why they studied computer science, uh, many of the students that I taught at Carnegie Mellon uh, would tell me that because a computer is the most complicated machine 
that humans have invented, I would argue that a robot is. Um, and if computers have been built as tools to help us organize the bits of information in our lives, robots have the potential to help us organize the atoms as well. So I think at the intersection of uh, applying computational power to bits of information and connecting those to machines that can actually alter the physical world is extremely exciting. There's many, many open problems and it's and actually uh, the most exciting time to be in robotics is actually today, I believe. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, maybe it's time for you to ask questions or make comment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think Hello, hello. What's going to happen in the next 50 years? Now, the, the easiest tack is to dismiss the questions because uh, the question because everybody was wrong 50 years ago, so we can't know, we can't know anything. But what can you say? It doesn't have to be on the full time horizon of 50 years, but what, what do you see about the future? Who wants to answer? Well, that's past the singularity, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know, it's hard to predict, especially the future, as Yogi Berra said. But uh, we'll have, if, if we just extend the pace of development of the last five or so years, or maybe 10, in AI and in robotics, I think you can uh, extrapolate that into much more efficient robots, much more intelligent robots, ones that have better sensing, better action, computations, better adaptability to current situations. So uh, more of the same is what I would say, but uh, might be at an accelerating pace. Uh, well, I'll just say, I, I, I think um, we will see many more robots and robotic devices in our life because of the demographic inversion. That's gonna be an incredible pull on us. And if we look at the, if we look at the history of, of computers, it started off rather slow, and then it, then it took off as we understood better ways to use them. And I think that's gonna be the same with robots. We're, we're, we're at this threshold where we're understanding better ways to use them. But the predictions back in the 60s, by the way, said the computers were gonna get sick of humans and get rid of all humans. And today, the predictions are saying the robots are gonna get sick of humans and get rid of all humans. I don't expect that part to happen. I just think we're gonna have a lot more robots in our lives. Thank you. Yeah. You want to comment on this? Okay, Usama. I agree. <laughs> so, uh, clearly, uh, reaching uh, human level intelligence uh, in our, a system that is going to be capable of doing all of these things autonomously is maybe going to be uh, uh, something uh, in the future. But uh, to go back to Peter's uh, uh, comment about uh, the needs for human uh, and assisting human and assisting the elderly, uh, I, I'm not sure if we really want to think about it as conditioned by reaching that level of human capabilities in the robotic system that is full autonomy and then we can uh, start assisting humans. I think already we are seeing a lot of uh, work that is bringing enough capabilities in the robotic system to interact and assist and work with human. And I think this is the direction that is taking us a little bit to a, a point where we can say uh, robots need our assistance. And there is uh, something that can, can be just uh, captured by talking about uh, the human is providing maybe the cognitive high level uh, uh, abilities uh, to a, a machine that is providing coordinated muscles and enough autonomy uh, to interact with human. And I think this is something that is realistic, that is happening and that is uh, bringing a lot of, a lot of uh, tools uh, like uh, James was mentioning earlier, and uh, uh, that is also bringing things about the continuous uh, physical world and about uh, the fact that we really need to, to deal with the challenge of manipulation. And this is uh, the second question, I mean, that you have, I think, manipulation. I don't know why you didn't include the arm in your shaky robot. You were supposed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my question. <laughs> well, 
uh, was the question, why did we not include the arm? <laughs> well, as a, if you look at an early uh, proposal and a, a concept diagram, and Nils created a wonderful uh, document many years later that's on the SRIA website about this, there was a picture of Shaky with two arms on it that was kind of like arms that were shortly built at Stanford and MIT thereafter, but it was just way beyond our capacity. We couldn't get the robot to roll smoothly, you know? Uh, so it was just way beyond the scope of what we could do. And again, there were two massive projects at universities to do the arm only. So I think from a research strategy point of view, that was probably the right call. But going back to the demographics issue, um, I think on anything like the, the present course and speed, there's not going to be a choice. Uh, and uh, I do agree with what you said, that we don't need a complete solution right out of the box. It can be incremental. We have haptics now. We have robots on the show floor right now that have some of this interaction ability. So I don't, I can't predict what the introduction and phasing and what capabilities will arrive at what point. But to me, there's a certain inevitability about it because the need is going to be so acute. That's fine, I agree. Right, I'd like to comment a little more on the genesis of the A-star algorithm as an example of the importance of collaboration. On one day, Nils was in his office sketching on the blackboard and working on how shaky should find his way around the world. And uh, uh, obviously, the world was small enough that an exhaustive Dijkstra-based uh, graph search could solve it. But he had an idea for a way to make the search more efficient and called me in as I walked past and said, what do you think of this uh, tweak to the algorithm? And I looked at it, and I thought, well, 90% it, of it feels right. But I think if you make this little change, it may be more efficient. And we looked at that when Peter happened to walk by. We called him in, and he looked at it, and he said, not only is that more efficient, that's optimal. That's the best you can ever do. We spent the next two weeks arguing over whether it was optimal or not, and if it was optimal, under exactly what constraints, under what conditions was it optimal. But the idea was it was a way of combining heuristic uh, real-world knowledge, such as what you get from maps, with a mathematical uh, algorithm uh, to get an optimal result, result. And I think that's why the paper was rejected. Uh, the uh, engineering community didn't, didn't think it was, uh, thought it was too formal, and the mathematics people thought it was too uncertain. And actually, I think the whole, it, it's an example of the whole shaky and uh, subsequent robot projects that need to combine uh, uncertainty, heuristic, real-world facts with a formal mathematical analysis to get optimal results. Well, as long as we're telling stories about A star, which got Nils's vote. Um, so I have a theory about why our paper got rejected. And I don't normally say this in public, but since there's not more than a few people here, I'll so my, my theory is that the world of computer science in those days was not really very theoretically based. Um, and I think what happened, and again, this is just my hypothesis, is that the journal editor took one look at our manuscript and saw that it was stuffed with these theorems. I said, well, theorems, send it off to the mathematicians to review. And a <clears throat> mathematician takes one look at it and says, you know, this whole deal is restricted to finite worlds. Who could possibly be interested in such a boring graph with only a finite number of, were, of uh, nodes? You know, so shoot it down. So it, it may have been an early example of the difference between computer scientists and mathematicians. A mathematician doesn't see a lot of difference between a graph with 10 nodes and 10 to the 100th nodes. It's you know, just some finite number. But to computer scientists, that difference matters. And maybe that's why Bert wound up founding a new journal to populate it with reviewers who appreciated the difference. And I'd like to say one more thing about Bert. Uh, not only did he contribute valuably uh, to that particular project, A Star, but to many others, and he taught me Lisp. Good work, Bert. Mm.
Okay. Check, uh, check, check. I would like just to point out that we are during the coffee break, so uh, I'll be happy to continue with this and uh, with the panel, which is very exciting. And I have already three questions here, but just to mention that the coffee break is ongoing. If uh, some people want to grab coffee, because mm -hmm. we, are, we have to start the session again at ten past for another round of presentations and uh, the keynote by James. So. Question here, uh, what do you think mm -hmm. is today's shaky? So something that people will look at 50 years from now and they will say that was remarkable. What is, what is today's shaky? Today's shaky. What is yes. today's shaky? My project? Something that is as <laughs> remarkable as shaky was 50 years ago. James, maybe it's a question for you. <laughs> yeah, right, yes. Well, I don't know if uh, there is a modern equivalent that is actually running the full vertical stack that Shaky ran, including the strips and logic. Uh, there's certainly a lot of mobile robots now that can navigate successfully. I think um, in terms of the computation that is available and the resources available, um, we can have robots uh, navigate pretty reliably indoors now. Um, they can do some amount of reasoning, um, but uh, uh, I would say that uh, you know you can't really buy right now a shaky uh, equivalent. Um, I sure hope that changes. Uh, I, I would just say that we're in a slightly different world uh, in the following sense. Um, today, the, it takes very large teams to get pieces together, and so those very large teams are often driven by commercial uh, requirements. It has to work out of the box. It has to be self-documenting. And to get a team together to get at the forefront of everything all together um, doesn't make commercial sense. So we don't have the ability to have such a, a moonshot research project, which gets back to something that, that Rosina said before and, and Nils just a minute ago about we have to figure out how to be bold still in the way that these people were bold. For sake of prolonging your, or missing your coffee break, let me just say that uh, to my mind, being in this business for four, 50 years, the current state of the affairs is still such that industry will do targeted robots for very particular particular applications and environments because those robots will guarantee safety, robustness, and um, error recovery. In academia, we don't have those constraints. So in academia, you will find smaller groups that will be focusing on either locomotion or planning or perception, but we are not yet there that in academia we can buy, let's say, a robot and just put on top of it some little, little PhD thesis. I use Baxter robots for teaching and it's a fantastic robot because it's safe. I don't have to worry that I will go to jail if my students get hurt and they learn the basic robotics technology. But it's not a robot that I will send to home at this point. Thank you. Okay, we have two questions. Wilfram was asking uh, since a long time. Maybe you can speak loudly. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Wolfram, and uh, I remember a couple of years ago I was with uh, Osama close to the Taj Mahal uh, having a seminar. I mean, you always go to nice places with Osama. Um, and I was in charge of being the devil's advocate and uh, telling that we actually didn't make progress in robotics over the past years. And I, for doing that, I pulled out the technical report about Cheki and explained that uh, the abstract is actually close to identical of that what we read in nowadays proposals for robots that are to be developed. And I just want to have uh, your take on uh, 
that what you see has changed in the past 50 years in robotics? I didn't quite get the question. You did everything already. <laughs> we did everything what? already. Oh, well, uh, lots to be done, as uh, was mentioned by some of the research problems that haven't quite been solved. And we aren't there yet. The robots uh, are not. We don't have robots that will clean up the kitchen for you, stack the dishes in the dishwasher. We don't have robots that will do all the housework. We have robots that drive cars, probably. Uh, but we don't have robots that will do a lot of things. Now, eventually, we will have some of these, I think. I don't think the problem is going to be as um, some of the pundits have worried about that they'll take over and keep us maybe as pets, as Marvin Minsky once said. I, I don't think that's going to happen. But I do think it'll have a major, major effect on employment and that there will be a lot of jobs that a lot of people will be displaced. Everybody said, don't worry about it. There's been automation in the past. It creates more jobs, yeah, it did, and it will. Those jobs can be automated too. The question is, Will there be enough jobs that, don't rec that can be performed by not sufficiently educated people, not sufficiently trained people? I don't think so. So then there's a question, okay, then what does society do about all that? Thank you. Okay, another last, very last question. He was waving since a long time. Thank you for the interesting discussion. I have a pragmatical question. So half of you have mentioned the importance of integrating AI reasoning into robotics. You have also mentioned that the goal of Shaky was to spark similar integration efforts. So I am in the new generation and I'm willing to work on such topics of integrating AI reasoning into robotics. And I was searching to join a team working on this topic. So whom do I approach? Who works on this today? Thank you. Who works on integrating AI and robot? That's the question. Reason, yeah. Who wants to answer? I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of us are very much interested in integrating AI with robotics. Uh, speaking just perfectly personally, I consider myself to be an AI researcher and interested in finding computational explanations for intelligence. And it became clear over a period of time that sensing and acting and interacting with the continuous physical world was an essential piece of the puzzle there. So that we needed to do vision and robotics and control and a bunch of other related things simply in order to solve the AI problem. So I think that many people in AI do already appreciate the importance of robotics, and pretty much everybody should. Furthermore, I think the people in uh, robotics and especially in computer vision ought to recognize that those tasks involve intelligence and they, they serve intelligent agents interacting with that world. And so the, the visual problems of an agent are significantly different from the visual problems of, for example, organizing a very large photo collection. So, um, yes, indeed, I mean, uh, it's a necessity. It's not just a choice to integrate AI and, and robotics. It's the same problem. Uh, it's the only way to achieve a physical system that's able to really act and interact in the real world. Yeah. So this is the program of everyone else, of us, I believe. We are addressing it in different manners, uh, focusing on different issues, but at the end, this is the problem to address. So with this, I would like to close uh, the panel, you have uh, like uh, 12 minutes to grab a coffee and come back. Uh, thank you very much for attending. I would like to thank the panelists. And this is a historic moment.